As introduced, I'm Bill Rawlings. I'm the administrator of the uh, organic uh, program. Um, there's five steps to organic certification. Um, first would be the organic system plan, which is what we'll talk about most today, because that's your plan on how to uh, implement or run your organic farm. Um, so that's kind of mainly about you and uh, probably what you need to hear and what you're here to um, listen to. Uh, next would be the initial review, the inspection, uh, the final review um, where we would uh, review the OSP, the organic system plan, and the inspection report, and then the certification decision. So uh, the organic uh, system plan, or the OSP, um, we call this your application or your update um, after you're certified, but uh, the majority of the organic community calls it an OSP. Uh, so the first is the general information, then the farm plan, seeds and seed treatments, uh, seedlings and planting stock, um, crop and, uh, or soil and crop fertility, crop management, uh, maintenance of organic integrity, uh, record keeping, labels, and attachments. Um, just for an idea, uh, how many crop producers do we, or uh, like field crops, uh, corn, soybeans, do we have in the audience? Okay. And uh, how many vegetable producers? Okay. Um, so we're going. We'll hit all bases if it was all crops or all. Um, or all row crops or vegetables, we'd go in a different direction. But um, so the general information, this is who uh, your name, whoever's filling out the application. Then we would uh, have you put down the farm name um, and then the owner's name. Uh, then you would have the mailing address, uh, contact information, uh, phone number, cell phone number, uh, fax number, email address. Uh, legal status of the business. Is it a sole proprietorship? Is it a partnership, an LLC, a corporation? And this is mainly because we have to verify that there's no conflicts of interest in our office. So we're going to ask you what the legal status of the business is and who are the members. Um, then the directions to the farm. If there's no like mailbox, but you have a, a big red rooster at the end of the road. You could put that down to help us find uh, your farm. And uh, then have you ever been certified before? Um, this, if you've been certified before, we have to verify that when you left your previous certification body, you uh, left in good standing that you didn't have any outstanding non-compliances. If you have outstanding non-compliances, we have to verify that they were corrected in order to certify you. Um, next is the farm plan. What are you planning on growing? Uh, where are you going to grow it? Um, field numbers, uh, how many acres are you going to grow? Your projected yields for the crop. Um, then the last data transition. This is helpful um, more if you're in the middle of transition and let's say your cornfield out there, you start transitioning it in June where you're going to harvest it in October. So when you harvest it, it will actually be organic corn instead of transitional. Then uh, parcel information. and. I'll probably repeat this twice because this is what everyone has trouble with. You're, you need to fill out the parcel information each year. This is the address of each parcel that you're farming so we can find it and so we can list it on a certificate. So if you have, one fa you have your home farm and then you're renting a farm down the road, uh, all those farms need to be included in your application. And you al should also include any transitional, any uh, conventional farms that you're farming. So we can verify that your organic system plan is sufficient to prevent commingling or contact with 
conventional crops. Um, and you'd also note if you own the land or if you rent it. Seeds and seed treatments. Um, this is a small section of the actual application, but it's more of an addendum. So what are your sources of seeds? Organic, non-organic that are non-treated, or are you saving your own? Uh, the requirements for an organic farm is to source organic seeds, unless they're not commercially available. So you got some wiggle room there on commercially available, but you need the document that the seed variety that I'm looking for is not available. Usually we do that um, with either you call three different seed sources or you have seed catalogs if you're doing vegetables to show that that uh, big bright red tomato plant, you can't find it organic. Um, on the seed list, you would put the variety, so big red tomato, and then your source. Uh, this would be more Johnny's, high mowing, uh, blue, ri blue River for corn, um, master's choice, something like that, not southern states in uh, Centerville, um, because that doesn't tell us what the brand is, that's just telling us who you're getting it from, and we want to know the brand. Uh, then if it's organic, who is the certifier? One uh, common mistake that we see is USDA. USDA is the regulatory body. The certifier would be Maryland Department of Agriculture agriculture, uh, PCO, um, OCIA, uh, so on. So we want to see who's certifying it. It should be on the package of seeds that you receive. Um, is the product treated? What is it treated with? Is it a fungicide or is it an inoculant? Um, and for treated seeds, we need to verify that that treatment is allowed. Uh, GMO, if you're using GMO seeds, it's because you're uh, split operation, parallel production, you also have some conventional, so you would say that you were using GMO seeds as well. Um, and your reason for picking non-organic, so your variety isn't available, the um, disease resistance of that seed is uh, superior to the organic variety. Um, then this is for vegetable growers, uh, seedlings and planting stock. Are you buying your seedlings or are you, raise, or are you uh, raising your own seedlings? If you're raising your own, then you'd want to go into how you're raising them. Uh, most people do a greenhouse, but there's some people that do them in the kitchen window. Uh, but if you're doing a greenhouse, uh, do you plant in the ground on that greenhouse? Um, is there treated wood? Treated wood is a uh, prohibited for new installation and in replacement. So if you have a greenhouse that's been there for five years that has treated wood, it's grandfathered in. But if you, a board rots off that's touching the ground, you cannot replace it with another treated board. Um, but if you wanna, the re regulation on treated wood is it cannot come in contact with the soil or the crop. So if you have another source like a sidewall or something that you want to use some treated wood on as long as it's not contaminating the soil or the crop. Um, it also asks for equipment used in a greenhouse. That would be your irrigation system. Uh, how do you clean it? Are you using it for, is your greenhouse split? Are you using, uh, using the irrigation system for conventional and organic? Um, what kind of pest management do you use? Uh, a lot of uh, greenhouses have trouble with like white flies and stuff in dirt, certain uh, seasons, so what do you do to control those? And then your soil fertility. What type of soil are you using? Are you using any uh, fertilizers to help the plant along um, as you're starting them? Uh, you'd list that as well. So on crop fertility, um, 
what is your plan to improve the soil? Uh, requirement of the organic program is that you maintain or improve soil quality. Uh, by doing this, you would use cover crops, uh, green um, inoculants that build nitrogen, uh, add manure. Um, what are you doing to improve that soil quality? Uh, if you're re using restricted products, right now the restricted products would be micronutrients. Um, magnesium, manganese, iron, boron. Um, if you're using those products, you need a soil test documenting that that crop is, that that crop needs that micronutrient. So you can't just go on there, out there and pour on some boron if you don't have documentation that the soil is deficient in it. What conservation practices are you using? Now, over here, um, you're pretty flat, so you don't have some of these, but are you using uh, contour farming? Um, do you have uh, wash strips or greenways to prevent erosion? Uh, what type of conservation pra practices are you using? Uh, also, you would address, do you have soil erosion? Uh, since one of the ideas is to maintain your natural resources uh, through organic farming, you want to make sure that your soil isn't washing away, your nutrients aren't going downstream. So if you have erosion, you want to be working towards fixing those problems so you're not losing your fertility. And then do you use water? Um, what type of irrigation system do you have? Um, one funny little thing, one time I was looking at a little like five acre garden plot and they said they had a center pivot uh, irrigation system. It ended up being one of them sprayers that goes around circles, but I kind of was confused when I read it. Um, crop management. Um, crop rotation is a big part of organic. Um, by rotating your crops, you cut down on the chances of certain diseases, certain insects. Um, you break their cycle. So you don't want to plant tomatoes in the same spot year after year, or you don't want to plant corn in the same spot year after year. Tomatoes, corn, they're both heavier feeders, but also because of the disease pressure. If you keep on planting something, those diseases, those uh, insects that prey on those uh, plants will come and start uh, becoming persistent and your yields are going to go down. So you want to have good crop rotation. Um, another as aspect of crop rotation would be implementing a cover crop. So you're building the soil as well in between those cash crops. Uh, weed management, pest management, and disease, disease management, they all kind of fall into the same like layout in the, uh, in the organic system plan. We're going to ask you what problems you're having. Like for weeds, we have a lot of Johnson grass and some crab grass, and then we have a little bit of Jimson weed, and then it asks what you're going to do to control those weeds. Are you going to cultivate? Are you going to have uh, plant suppression crops to try to suppress them? Um, and a lot of the items that you're going to implement are in little check boxes. So you can check, yeah, I'm going to rotate my crops and I'm going to uh, use suppression crops and I'm going to use a flame weeder when needed, uh, items like that. So it also kind of gives you ideas of what kind of management practices you can use. Um, also under weed management, there's a section for uh, mulches. Plastic mulch is one of the popular ones to control weeds. Plastic mulch has to be removed after the growing season. And uh, there was regulations Im implemented to allow biodegradable plastic, but the uh, great federal government uh, made those regulations so none of the biodegradable plastic mulches comply with it. So you can't use biodegradable plastic mulch right now. Uh, 
diseases. Um, so during, also in the uh, pest management section, you'll be asked what pest, um, how are you preventing them, and how would you evaluate your plan? Um, are you doing a good job? Are you doing an excellent job? Or is the pest pressure getting the best of you and you're doing a poor job? So it's kind of self-evaluation as well. Maintenance of organic integrity. Um, first, you would assess your adjoining land use. Or is your, is your fields surrounded by woods? Or on the north side is their uh, conventional neighbor and he's also planting GMO corn and you plan on planting GMO, or, uh, organic corn. Um, items like this, you need to assess what's going on around you to help assess how you can comply with the regulations. Um, since I brought up GMO corn and if you're producing organic corn and you got the conventional neighbor that's doing GMO, uh, you might want to try to figure out what rotation they are on so maybe you can plant your corn on a year that your neighbor is planting soybeans so you don't have that cross-contamination. That way when you take your uh, corn to Purdue or wherever, they don't do that little GMO test and you come back with contaminated corn. Uh, parallel production. Are you just starting out, starting out small, so you have your conventional operation and you want to try some organic? Well, parallel, there's two types of systems like this. You would have your split operation where you might be doing organic field crops, row crops, and then you're doing your conventional uh, vegetables or vice versa. But then you also have a parallel production where you growing corn, both organically and conventionally. Excuse me. If you're, uh, if you're doing that parallel production, uh, equipment cleaning is going to come into effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, mainly your tillage equipment. If you're using that for both your organic and conventional, you're going to wa want to wash off your equipment and document it between going from the conventional field to the organic field. Or um, kind of a bigger deal is if your conventional corn's ready, you uh, harvest it and then you bring the combine over for your organic, you're gonna have to clean it, get all that conventional seed out of it. Um, here you're gonna want like a procedure to rid the combine of all that conventional seed and then you want to be able to document that you pr completed that procedure. Um, some of this can be done with a purge. Other parts would be like washing the combine, blowing it off, uh, some way to get rid of all the debris from the conventional crop. Then you go into your harvest. How are you harvesting it? Um, mainly this would come into effect for vegetables, but are you using containers? What type of containers are you using? Are they just for organic, or do you clean them between conventional and orga organic harvest? Then post-harvest handling, um, if you're a vegetable operation and you're cleaning your vegetables before taking them to market, how are you cleaning them? <coughs> Excuse me. One of the uh, one of the cases that we ran into this year was uh, a farm was cleaning their vegetable with a, a chlorine solution, but they were not following the directions for cleaning or using that chlorine as a disinfectant for food. So you got to make sure that you're following the directions on your products that you're using as well. Um, Then crop storage. Uh, if you're storing crops, you're going to want to have a record of it. So let's say you're a grain operation and you have four grain bins. Two of them you're going to put your organic, 
two of them, you're going to put your conventional. You're going to want to identify those organic grain bins and have some kind of a way to distinguish that they're organic and then be able to document that they were clean when you uh, put your organic crop into it. Um, then uh, if you're storing maybe some other product that like let's say you're a vegetable operation and you have boxes of produce and you're putting it in a cooler you want to have a dedicated section for your organic so you are segregating it from your conventional product and transportation who arranges for transportation are you transporting it or are you having a custom trucker uh, for bulk product when that custom trucker comes in are you verifying that the truck is clean I believe we heard this morning where rail cars were a uh, area where grain was being contaminated with GMO well before you load that truck you want to make sure that it's clean so your crop doesn't get contaminated and then you pay the consequences record keeping now since we can't be out there 60, 100, or 365 days a year verifying that you're following the organic regulations this is where record keeping comes in when you record what you're doing uh, to produce your organic product this is your verification that you're complying with the organic regulations so uh, first question or it's the last question on the sheet but the first question I'm going to ask is how long do you keep your records a lot of farmers I talk to uh, we don't throw anything away but there is a requirement in the National Organic Program that you keep your records for five years. So it's kind of interesting when I do an inspection, I ask that question and I get three years, five years, and then some people go with the tax answer and say seven years. Um, but mainly what type of records are you keeping? Your field activity records. These are cultivation. Maybe you laid your plastic. Um, uh, cultivation of a crop uh, just when you did something where you did it um, just good record keeping if you're cultivating that's kind of documenting that you're trying to control them weeds so if down the line you come in with the vinegar and start spraying weeds you have, you can show that you tried to control them a mechanically a mechanical way um, because some of the Pesticides have uh, restrictions on it that you need to try cultural methods, that, that you need to try crop rotation, things like that before you actual, actually use a chemical to control the pest. Um, planting records. Uh, I'll back up a little bit. Records need to be adapted to fit your operation. So I can't tell you how to keep your records, just what you need to keep. So um, it t sometimes takes a couple years to figure out what works for you, and we usually work with you on that, uh, but you do need to have records. Um, and we'll try to point you in the right direction. Uh, but planting records, what we like to see is that you can identify how much you planted, when you planted it and where you planted it. So if you're growing corn and you're planting a population of 25,000 per acre, it's pretty easy. But if you're that vegetable grower and in February you start your tomato plants and you start six, cell, or, uh, six flats of 72, and then in May you plant them out in the field, but you only plant five of those flats that's where we kind of sometimes records get oh, lost or not recorded because it's a busy time of the year so just have a plan on how you're going to keep those records input application records um, how much did you apply and when did you apply it to what field or to what crop 
Um, and we'll get to it at the end, but ATRA has some good uh, documents to help you keep these records if you need examples. Then harvest records. How much did you harvest and on what date is the main thing that we're looking for there. Now, sometimes when you get into vegetables, we it can be a little simpler. Like if you're producing corn, you should have be able to say like a date and an amount. If you're doing CSA or something and you have your record of how much you're distributing to your CSA and on what date, that kind of fits your, fills your need for harvest records and sales records. And so moving on the sales records, if you're storing your corn, you're going to have, you sold out of bin two on March the 3rd and you sold 650 bushel, uh, something like that. And let's see, storage you would, when you harvest you would record where you stored it, you uh, then when you sold it you would have that it left that storage area. Yes? You can write it down, have receipts, like you can, as long as it seems legitimate to the, our inspectors, that's good enough. Now, if something seems shady, we might say you, you need to change it a little bit. But um, as long as you can verify where it goes, uh, like for crops, you might want to lot identification number for like if it's a big bulk of crop now the problem is we're talking like for like corn a hundred acre field you got a large amount if you're a little CSA and you got three rows of carrots you're talking about a different amount it might not be as important to have that lot number for that product. Um, so, any other questions? Because record keeping can be kind of confusing, or there's so many ways to do it that can comply with the regulations. It it's just a case by case basis. Yes. Um, we refer you to the uh, ATRA website um, for documents that could help you with these records. There's software. I forget the name of it. But there's a, a couple years ago, uh, organic traceability software came out, and I've I know it's out there, but I just forget the name of it. I, not many of our clients use it. They kind of adapted their own record keeping system. Okay. Um, labeling, not a lot of farms are labeling their product, but if they are, let's say you had a bag of lettuce and you wanted to put organic lettuce on it, and then you put Let's say your farm name was Ag Organic. You would put your address and then Certified Organic by the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Now, when you're making an organic claim, you need to put your name and address on the label, and then below that, it needs to say Certified by whoever you're certified by. Okay, attachments to your application. This would be your map or maps. Uh, on your maps, we want to see your buffers. Now, sometimes you don't have to have buffers if you have a good neighbor that doesn't spray and they will attest to not using chemicals on their property. Then you might be able to get away with not having a buffer between their property line and your organic field. 
uh, but any other place you'd want to have an adequate buffer. And the regulations say, or the regulations are that you need an adequate buffer. So it kind of is up for interpretation. We usually like to see about 25 foot, um, but in the case of your neighbor growing GMO corn and you're growing organic corn, that buffer is going to increase. Um, some reports I've heard is uh, the pollen, well, the pollen can go for miles, but some people require like 600 foot buffers. So. A, a, a road? Um, depends where you live. Like sometimes out in the western part of the state, they like to go along the road and spray that Johnson grass and the thistle. So in that case, you would put up no spray signs, but you'd also want to communicate with the county roads department and people like that to make sure that they don't spray. So it can the road can count um, and it depends on how r wide the road is what's going on on the other side of the road but uh we do allow no spray signs along roads yes right and that would be in your records that you were harvesting from the buffer zone. Um, you'd record that you harvested the north and west buffer and you got so many bales and what you did with it. Uh, field sizes. You want to write down what size your fields are on the map and a field identification. Um, since we're on field identification, uh, it's nice when you use numbers or something simple. Um, one time I, we had a client that had names and about 25 fields and a lot of them were two word names. That is a real bear to write down on an inspection report all those names. Um, field history sheets. This is mainly when you start um, start out your organic certification process, you want to document what has uh, occurred on those fields the last three years, what you've planted, what inputs you've used. Um, so this say in 2014 was the last year that you used Roundup on July 7th. You would put down applied Roundup July 7th on field one. And then after that you'd only use non-treated or organic seeds, you use cow manure. Um, you'd write all that information down. So then we knew that July 7th, 2014, was the day that you started transitioning that field. So on July 7th, 2017, that field would be eligible for organic production. Um, then comes your inputs and seed list. So we talked about the seed list a little bit earlier, um, how you write down the variety, the uh, source, the certifier, if it was treated, what was it treated with, if it was non-organic, why didn't you use organic? Um, inputs list is around, along the same lines. Uh, what are you using? Now, the more information, the better. So if you put down fish emulsion, there's a lot of different fish emulsions. But if you put down Alaska 511, then we know what you're talking about because Alaska 511 is an OMRI approved product and we can find that easily. So uh, the more information on the inputs list that you can provide, uh, the better so we can quickly review those products and make sure that they meet the organic standards. Uh, your soil test. Um, just like the nutrient management plan, we uh, require a soil test every three years to make sure that you're maintaining or improving that soil quality. We don't want you mining from the land, taking all the nutrients out of the soil um, to grow your crops and not adding anything back to it. Then your labels. Um, the label that we, the labeling process that we just went over a couple slides ago, you want to include any of those labels that you're using or if you have labels for these inputs 
um, that you have on your inputs list, you can include them so we can review them easy, easily. And then um, we talked in the uh, general information section about corporations, partnerships. Um, you want a list of your members so we can make sure that there's no conflicts of interest with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. So your part is done. You finally got that organic system plan in the mail. Um, one thing that I didn't include, now the organic system plan has the cost share sheet on the front. You remove that cost share sheet. You put that with your $500 check, which is the certification fee. You will send that to an address in Baltimore. Um, they don't trust us with checks at the Department of Agriculture anymore. Um, we didn't lose any, but I guess some bad apples ruined it for all of us. So the check goes to a lockbox with the cost share. They process it, take your money, and then we get the paperwork back. Um, you send the application, the maps, labels, everything else to Annapolis, to the Department of Agriculture building. So we get the map, we get confirmation that you sent your payment to the lockbox, we'll put you in the system, give you a three-digit number that will be your certification number, and then we'll review it. Make sure that everything is complete in your organic system plan. Look through the packet, make sure you didn't leave anything out. Then uh, we'll look at your attachments, make sure that the maps, uh, that we can identify the buffer zones, the field numbers, the field sizes. Uh, we'll look at your field history, your soil test. After we deem that everything's there, um, we review it for compliances with the National Organic Program. So if you say uh, your weed control method is using Roundup, that doesn't comply with the National Organic Program standards. Um, so if anything is no, we might send you additional confirm or, uh, communication. We'll, we have a nice little check sheet that says uh, when we reviewed your organic system plan, we couldn't find your soil test or we couldn't find maps with buffers. So we'll send you this page. You'll update that information, send it back to us. After we are satisfied that we have enough documentation to show that you have the potential to comply with the organic standards, um, we'll assign the inspection. So we assign the inspection. We send it to the inspector. By the way, we have an inspector here, uh, Keith Conley, that uh, if you're on the Eastern Shore, you'll most likely see him one year or another. Um, so Keith or someone else will contact you, set up a time to come out and do your organic inspection. Um, inspections can last anywhere from two hours to four hours, sometimes more depending on what type of operation. Dairy farms have been known to take six hours. Um, so you schedule the inspection, the inspector comes out. First thing they should do is introduce themselves, go over that they're here to do your organic uh, inspection, um, get an idea of the farm, maybe ask you some questions. How long have you been in business? Uh, how long have you been farming? Um, then usually we choose, or at least on the first visit, we'll choose to take a tour and we need to look at all the fields that you have um, submitted for organic certification and assess them, make sure that your buffer zones seem adequate, um, that there's no chance of contamination, make sure that there's not evidence of chemical fertilizers or uh, synthetic uh, pesticides, um, items like that. Then we'll uh, look at the equipment that you're using. And um, brings up, I don't know how many of you have all of the equipment that you use. I know some areas might rent uh, the soil conservation's drill or 
might have a custom harvester come in. Um, that's one of those things in your cleaning log, in your records, you want to have records of, especially when it's coming off the farm, you need to clean that equipment to make sure that it's not contaminating your organic system. But they'll, uh, they'll evaluate your equipment. Um, another item when we, that we look for when evaluating equipment is there oil leaks that could contaminate the soil. Um, Then we'll uh, look at any inputs that you have on hand, any seeds. Uh, vegetable producers usually have like a bulk bin and we'll look through the seeds, get an idea of how many seeds you purchased organically, how many were non-treated, and make sure that that kind of jives with the seed list that you uh, submitted. If you submitted that you were using all organic seeds and then there's all these non-treated seeds, it kind of ra raises a red flag. Um, so after we look at everything, your land, your input, your equipment, we'll uh, go down and get to the fun part. And for all the producers, they can talk about and show you whatever, the, everything that they have, but when you get into the records, that's when they become stressed. Uh, so we'll sit down. The majority of the record keeping, we'll look at your input applications, we'll look at your um, harvest planning, sales. We'll look at all that. We'll usually do about two tracebacks. So we'll ask you to show us a sale. We'll look at that sale and you sold 600 bushel of uh, corn. So we'll say let's go back and look and see when that corn was harvested. Okay, when did you plant it? Did you apply any inputs to it? Um, what went on in the production of this corn? So. We'll write all that down in our respect inspection report, make sure that nothing's missing. Um, if you're doing vegetables and you're, you have a CSA, we might say, uh, let's look at these tomatoes. You had uh, 100 CSA members. You gave them each five pounds of tomatoes, so you gave out 500 pounds of tomatoes this week. Um, when did you harvest this, these tomatoes? When did you plant them? Were there any inputs? Um, when did you start them or did you buy your starts? And so on and so forth. Um, in the future, there could be potential for uh, verifying inputs that you purchased enough inputs for the year. Um, we haven't been doing that as much, but um, that's where, why you always need to keep your, all your records so if one day we do ask that, that you have it on hand and um, you can verify that you purchased enough inputs that you used. So after we get done the records, then it gets easier. We go through, we ask you some questions about your pest management, um, your, are you starting seeds? We'll, we'll pretty much go through all the sections of the organic system plan and ask you questions. Make sure that when we ask you the question, it matches what you put on the organic system plan. Um, so after we complete all that, the inspector will take a couple minutes, uh, fill out an exit interview. Uh, this is uh, going through different sections like record keeping, your organic system plan, your use of prohibited products, um, your weed management, pest management, disease management, seeds, all those areas. And <clears throat> let's say we went through, or I'll save that, but um, if there was an issue, it'll be cited in the exit interview. At the end of the inspection, the inspector will sit down with you, say, for record keeping, you were missing this record. It didn't seem to be a occurrence, you were just missing it on this day. Or um, if there's something of concern, they'll write it down um, just for the uh, people in the office to look at a little deeper. Um, the inspector does not uh, determine organic certification. They're just our eyes out there in the field. So. Um, 
sometimes we get that the inspector said that we passed well the inspector doesn't determine that they just do their inspection and then the pass fail is kind of later on in the process so now we're to the fourth step we're coming down the home stretch so the final review um, inspection comes back into our office we uh, will take and compare the inspection report and the uh, OSP to make sure that they match that there's no big changes that have occurred um, one one thing that we kind of see more often is uh, sometimes m between the maps your organic system plan and the inspection report we have gotten three different acreages so please make sure that you stay consistent in your acreage um, between your organic system plan your maps and what you uh, tell the inspector um, so we'll match up the organic system plan and the inspection report uh, we'll evaluate any uh, issues that the inspector might have documented on the um, inspection report and here's where we would get into what what is the severity of the issue if you were missing records for one day that's not as severe as you didn't have any harvest records if you don't have any harvest records that would most likely be a notice of non-compliance if you were just missing one day we just write a friendly little reminder in the certification letter that says um, please remember the keep records uh, for all your activities and then uh, we would make a recommendation for or against certification um, so this is just the during the review process so everything's there it uh, gets sent to the big boss and um, the desert certification decision would be made so if everything looks good you've answered all the questions it looks like or you've documented that you can comply with the national organics program standards certification or certification is granted um, next step is you get that nice certificate that says that you're organic you can sell organic products and we send you a nice sign that says Maryland certified organic um, worst case scenario uh, you were issued a non-compliance you couldn't address it or didn't address it um, then you would be issued the a denial of certification so that is the certification process good and bad um, inputs we're kind of stretched for uh, people in the office so the best the easiest way to get an input approved is if it's already approved by the organic materials review institute or omri um, or listed on the Washington uh, State Department of Agriculture's website. We also uh, contract with another certifier. Um, so if it's on their list, we can also approve it pretty quickly. If not, we have to do our own material review, and that can take some time uh, getting the information from the company. And because we're smaller, sometimes the company won't release it to us. So um, if if you can find Omri approved products uh, that's better better but we also review other products as well um, some of the resources well you got the Maryland Department of Agriculture website uh, here's the link to we're under the food and feed qual or we're under food quality but um, kind of the way they go through it it's a five-step process too you go to the Maryland Department of Agriculture's website you click on food and feed quality and then you click on click on food quality and then you click on organic certification and that's how you find the applications um, on the right hand side of the uh, page you'll find handlers and producers you would most likely be applying as a producer and you would go to the new crop and pasture application um, resources uh, continued um, the National Organic Program um, the National Organic Program has a lot of 
interesting things, but they kind of redid their website, so it's all kind of hard to find. But um, if you want to search something on Google, just uh, put National Organic Program. Uh, oh my, brain fart. Let's see. Um, sound and Sensible. So they did this Sound and Sensible project. Uh, they have a nice, lot of nice little uh, video clips of different um, ways to become certified. Uh, and one of the examples is like this guy, vegetable th farmers thinking about becoming organic, and it's interactive. So you hear the dilemma that he's faced with, and it gives you four choices. And if you ch pick this choice, it goes to another little video, and it tells you whether you made the right choice. So it's interactive, and it's a good learning tool. Um, excuse me, to assess your uh, knowledge of the organic certification process, kind of give you ideas of what's the proper way to go about different issues that you might run into. And then it also has uh, one for crop inspections, uh, a livestock inspection, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what to expect. Then you got ATRA. ATRA is the, um, they got a lot of publications on organic farming, um, and they have different uh, record keeping tools that you might want to look into. Um, e organic, they do a lot of uh, webinars. Um, I was supposed to do a feed safety one or food safety one yesterday, um, and I saw one for uh, f um, sprouting your own grains for organic uh, dairy production. So they cover a lot wide variety of uh, topics on organic related uh, issues. And now we're to the end. Um, the Maryland Department of Agriculture Organic Program. Uh, our program manager is Deanna Baldwin. Um, we have Keith Connolly, one of our inspectors. Molly Gillingham and Amy Kovac are also inspectors. And then you have me, Bill Rawlings, uh, inspector, administrator, jack of all trades, and ace of none. So, any questions? Yes. 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 Um, you're not required to uh, oh, go through the Maryland Department of Agriculture for organic certification. There's private entities that uh, certify. Um, kind of some of the popular ones is a agency out of Gainesville, Florida, QCS. Um, then you have Pens uh, Pennsylvania Certified Organic to the north. Um, they're private, so they can go outside of the the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so there's no requirement. And if the good thing about Maryland is we're cheap. So that's why a lot of um, people go to us. Um, the more complex your operation, uh, it kind of slows us down because of the like processing that goes into it. So if you're real complicated and you need fast turnarounds, some of the other certifiers might be a better um, choice for you, um, just to be upfront and honest. Uh, but um, there's no nothing against you going to a private certifier. And if anyone that is certified by a private certifier, you can submit your certification, uh, a copy of your certificate, and the invoice that you receive from that certifier, and a cost share application, and we, we can uh, issue you cost share on your cost. Um, I think it's, it can be up to $750 per scope. So if you paid $4,000 and you were a crop and uh, livestock, you could get up to $1,500 back. Well, thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>